All right, then, if you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask that you turn to some familiar scripture, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16. Um, Matthew 16, and we're going to begin in reading in verse 15. Matthew 16, beginning in verse 15, the Bible says, He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for an opportunity to meet with thy people tonight. Lord, we thank you for a good building, a place to meet out of the elements, Lord. We give you praise for that. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to preach. And in many places that does not exist in public worship, we thank you that it still does exist here for now. We give you great praise and glory for that privilege. Uh, we pray now that you might uh, anoint your word, Lord, that you would touch the hearts of those that are here for your glory and your honor. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, very familiar verses of Scripture. Uh, two things really that happens here. The, the first one, uh, Peter certainly... Re, uh, is understanding the person of Christ. Now, the problem with you say this prayer after me or you pray and it'll all work out is this, there's no revealing of Christ in that. And if you do not have Christ revealed to you as a person, in verse 17, he's very clear, flesh and blood, and this old brain is included in the flesh and blood. You can't think yourself and believe yourself uh, in, in that way to be saved, but he says that's all flesh and blood, but my Father reveals it. That's really what distinguishes us between every other kind of Baptist and, and the Baptist that came from the Bible is we know that it's a revelation of God and not a revelation of man. If it was a revelation of man, you know what? I'd be the first one telling these children, you repeat this prayer after me and all will be well, but it's simply not so. So how could I possibly do that and have, and have any peace of God at all? So he, he, he commendates Peter and he says, this came from God. Then secondly, he says, you're Peter, that's a sound truth, that's your name, you are Little Rock. And then he says, uh, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, in that same promise, he, he promised that he was going to build his church in his earthly ministry. It did not happen on Pentecost. It did not happen in the early uh, accounts of Acts. It happened in the Lord Jesus Christ's own personal ministry. And I personally believe it was empowered at Pentecost, but it was not. It, it preceded that. You find in Acts uh, chapter 1, they actually had a business meeting and decided what to do with Judas Iscariot's office and for the money that was in the treasury. And they decided all that and, and it, certainly, uh, it certainly presents that we already had a church long before Pentecost, probably 40 days before Pentecost, and the Lord empowered it. So uh, we'll find what, why is it important to be in the Lord's church? Uh, why is it important to, uh, to not just let salvation be enough? Why is it critical that people are in the Lord's church? Now, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter, and we might read it, I believe it's 14, says this, I, meaning the Lord God of heaven, I 
have placed some in the church. So we see that God is involved in both. He's completely involved in salvation. He's completely involved in being part of the church. You know, we come and we come out of routine and we come out of uh, we come out of habit. But have you ever thought what a wonderful, glorious thing it is to be able to meet with one of the Lord's churches? Why is that unique? Why is that special? Well, uh, Lord being our helper, we're going to find out tonight why, uh, what are the special blessings of being in the Lord's churches and what are the, uh, what are the challenges that, pre that also come of that. Now, not everything is health and wealth and not everything's uh, a feel-good hub. You know what? There are some challenges in being one of, in one of the Lord's true churches. You're going to be criticized. Uh, they're going to tell you that you're snobby. They're going to tell you all the redeemed make up the church. Now, the, the truth of the matter, that is not true. Because if he placed some in the church, he did place all, right? Uh, if there's a general church, then, uh, then in all likelihood there would have to be a general atonement too. And we certainly don't believe that. We believe that die, that the Lord Jesus died for his own, his own particular group. And, and what kind of example would be a general church if you had a particular redemption? It, it just, it, it does not, uh, it is not what the Bible teaches. And, and so we find uh, what, what, what is so important about being in the, one of the Lord's churches. Um, I want to look at Acts and uh, Duncan uh, accuses me of uh, being negative sometime, and I tell her I'm just trying to keep up with her. Um, Acts chapter 5, but we're going to look at little challenges that the church has been promised and always has had these problems. Acts chapter 5 and verse 11. Now, we're not going to read the whole text. We're just going to read uh, uh, the first portion of it, um, just that one verse. But I'll lead you up to that. What has occurred is that event with Ananias and Sapphira. And Ananias uh, sold some land. He acted like he gave the whole pile to the church, which would have been fine. He lied about it. He, he kept back a part, is what the Bible says, which would have been fine, too. If he'd been honest. See, uh, the very best thing a saved person can do and the very best thing a lost person can do is to be honest with God. Now, I, I, I personally believe Ananias and Sapphira were both fakes. I don't think they had any redemption about them, whatever. Uh, they were there for the ride. They were there to look good. But notice verse 11. Uh, after they died, and you know the story, Ananias came in first and said, Ananias, uh, what well, have Satan filled thee? Was not the land yours? And then he fell down in, de in his death, and then Sapphira came in, and they said to her, and she, uh, and, and uh, Peter says, have you agreed to lie to God? And she fell dead. Now after that, notice what happens. And great fear came upon all the church. This is the church at Jerusalem. And great fear came upon all the church and as many as heard these things. Now, I want you to notice two things. That one thing about being a member of one of the Lord's churches is this. There's some fearful things that come along with it because we get a special understanding of who God is. Now, can you imagine uh, the fear that gripped the people when they knowingly lied to God, fell down, and gave up the ghost? You know, that would scare me to death. You, you know what? It gets, it, it, this is the reality of it. It was an illustration of the holiness of God. See, that, that's forgotten today. You, you know, with your rock bands up here and, and carrying on and plopping on the floor, the holiness of God is gone. But see, Ananias and Sapphira got a reminder, didn't they? And, and all the church did too, so they were fearful. And it got a hold of their attention. attention. So I want you to see that one thing concerning the church can be fear. 
Not, not fear like, oh my goodness, it's fear that we respect God. Now, I want you to see in great fear upon, uh, came upon all the church and upon as many as had heard these things. So we have a separate group that heard about it and said they were fearful too. Now, what does that tell me? There were two distinct groups. There was the church, and there were probably other believers around that said, whoo. But, but who did those two people die with? They died with the church. Very special revelation of the holiness of God. And, and, and that's what we get when we assemble together, when we as one of the Lord's true churches meet together and bind together, we see some special things even when they're fearful. Acts chapter 8 in the first verse. Acts chapter 8 in the first verse. And Saul was consenting unto his death, meaning Stephen. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. So another thing, and listen, church, it's coming again, is persecution. That's not a cartwheel, glory to God, uh, type of element promised to the church, but we are promised persecution. Uh, you know, I often think about the Lord Jesus Christ's true church in relation to Israel, and if you will, rem remind yourself of what they endured down in Egypt. Remind yourself when they got out of the will of God how they lost their own temple. Remind yourself again uh, of, the, uh, of the persecution that they endured simply because they would not follow God. And then we have the church in the modern day uh, very much likened to the nation of Israel. And he says, listen, there's going to be persecution uh, you know, they closed the Stewart County schools this week, and I guess they'll be closed for the rest of the week. I don't know about next week yet, but you know, this is what I'm, I, I'm telling you tonight is this. There'll be a day, and probably COVID will be the vehicle that they're going to say you can't meet anymore. And what we have to determine even now before that day arrives, are we going to, are we going to get on the bandwagon and say, okay, or are we going to stand up for our freedoms? That, that has to be a pre-answered question. You can't wait for that day. You know what shutting the Lord's churches is, is called? Persecution. You know what? Uh, throwing a man in jail because he will not uh, he will not comply with hey we're not going to meet it's called persecution and it is coming again that that will be a hallmark of the Lord Jesus Christ's people. Now we've enjoyed really 250 years of wonderful wonderful freedoms in this nation. We we have enjoyed being able to assemble together and preach the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I would say the last 75 years we've not appreciated it. Amen. And when you don't appreciate something, the Lord will pull it from you, and then you'll understand what a wonderful blessing it was yeah. previously. So we're promised persecution in the first verse of chapter 8. And there was a great persecution at, against the church, which was at Jerusalem. I want you to see it's a specific church. Now, uh, we know at least one other group already existed, and that was at Antioch, because Paul is fixing to go there. Uh, there was one uh, also... Uh, that he, he was on his way to that town uh, in chapter 9 when the Lord saved him and brought him out of it. And uh, that was at Damascus. But so it specifically says this, despite Damascus, despite Antioch, this separate church, this first church in Jerusalem had gone under great, uh, great problems and was remaining faithful. And uh, they were all scattered abroad uh, throughout the re regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. They were still at Jerusalem. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. So persecution is calamity after calamity. Just persecute them anyway. Havoc. It's like a great storm. 
It, the whole desire is to scatter you. The hurricane that was in Louisiana over the weekend, that was havoc. It, it scattered things from stem to stern and everywhere in between. Why would the devil want that? It ended up for being the church's betterment because it's the greatest missionary that came out of that that ever lived. But he wants us down and out. He wants us scattered. That, that's the very reason about all this crazy COVID stuff. See, when you're locked up at your house and you're not worshiping God, it will not be real long before you say, forget it. It ain't worth it to start with. And you'll quit meeting when you do have that opportunity. And that is certainly the devil's plan. And so we see... They had two major events. They had persecution, and then on top of that, uh, they were given a second dose of havoc, and it came to, directly from Saul, just totally beating them down. Notice how it manifested itself, and hauling men and women, and committed them to prison. And that was the goal. Now, Listen, prison in those days weren't three hots and a cot. No. Uh, prison in that day was the only way you got food is some of your loved ones brought it to you. That, that was prison then. But I, I've never been in jail. I've never been to prison. But uh, they say the most miserable part is if you ever get in solitary confinement. And you literally have no one to talk to. Uh, a lot of people, uh, I, I read a missionary book, and this was when the fall of Russia began. Um, all the Eastern Bloc nations were beginning to be part of the Soviet Union right after the Second World War. And there was a preacher man there preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they said, you're going to have to shut up. You're going to have to put this aside. And of course, like most some men, he would not do it. He ended up in a Russian prison for six years in solitary confinement in a cell that did, he, did not even have light. Now, most people in that situation will go insane. But God, uh, but uh, his relationship with the Lord God was so strong when they uh, finally let him out, his only response was, blessed be the name of the Lord. See, that... <laughs> What the devil sees is something that will end it is something that the Lord God can bless, can make a wonderful thing. So we see these, these attacks against the church continually. Um, Acts, Acts 12, and I promise I'm getting to the good stuff soon. Uh, Acts 12 in the very first verse. Acts 12 in the very first verse, the Bible says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, that's James the apostle, the brother of John with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. Um, and, and we say, well, that never can happen here. Don't ever say never. Uh. Uh, because see uh, they killed James very deliberately and they were anxious to kill Peter as well and in fact they would have killed Peter if God hadn't physically delivered him that, that was their plan but you know it is a very likelihood listen uh, this thing is moving fast as a train running downhill that we barely might be the ones that say yeah take my head off or deny the person of Christ. Uh, that, that's very much a reality. And I want you to see all these individuals, what were they? They were members of the Lord's church. They were member, they, these that took the Bible, Stephen, James, all of them were members of the church in Jerusalem, and they were getting the, full, the fullest thrust, you know, uh, large churches that have agreed, and, and, and we're talking about uh, this the other evening, and I won't say the town, but I'll say this, it's the town where our mission is at. The, the supposedly uh, church there has not met 
since September of last year. They met for two weeks, and when the numbers came up again, they quit again. What are they going to have left after a year of not glorifying God? And my, my suggestion is this, they're not going to have nothing. Now, they may meet together, but God won't be in that place. And, and so we find whatever church is standing for the truth, listen, as much as we should, that's the church that's going to get the bullet. And, and so we see that this was a very difficult time for the Lord's true church, and, and everybody had turned against them. The government, uh, the Jewish nation, everybody had turned against the Lord's people. So if you want to be in one of the Lord's true churches, dear friend, know what you're signing up for, because there's bad, but there's a wonderful, wonderful amount of good. There's a wonderful, wonderful amount of, of blessings to be in the Lord's church. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. The Bible says this. Then had the churches rest. Yeah. Now, I, I will point out this because... Uh, of late, you know, of, of determined people want to determine what is a church and what is not. We're in Acts chapter nine, and he's already saying churches. This is prior to Paul and Barnabas' great mission journey, and it's already saying churches mm -hmm. more than one. So this is past the time of Jerusalem, and as I have already said, uh, Paul was. Uh, Led uh, was was led <laughs> on to Antioch, and uh, um, and there was already a church there. And so he says there was peace in the churches. Now you know what? It may be going to hell in a handbasket out there, but there's peace in the churches, is it not? Mm -hmm. And you know what? Remember this. When you, when you begin to think, okay, this is it. How far could the devil attack uh, Job? Only as far as God would let him. Kept him on a leash. And you know what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Even today, the devil can only go as far as the Lord God will Amen. allow. Amen. And you know what? If he says, okay, the whole bunch is going in jail... If we believe in sovereignty, that has to be the will of God. Uh, uh, you can't believe it both ways and say, well, Satan got a victory. No, no. Uh, if I understand the, the, this word like I, I believe I do, Satan has never got a victory. And he knows it. Uh, and so we find then that there's great blessing. There, there, there was peace in these churches then had, uh, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified walking in the fear of the Lord. Now, one blessing that, that believers outside, and I certainly believe they're safe folks outside the Lord's churches. I think that's what makes it a, a wonderful blessing to be in one of the Lord's churches. He says they were edified. They were built up. You know, you know uh, what's necessary for being built up edification? Physically, you have to have a real good diet. And the very same is true spiritually. If you don't get a good diet, you're not going to be edified. And where is the absolute best place to get the best spiritual food? Sure. Right at one of the Lord's true churches. Right. Yeah. If you want to be edified, if you want to be built up. So they had this wonderful peace. And while they were enjoying this peace, they heard so much truth, they were edified. Now, why do you suppose he builds us up at times? Why does he meet with us at times? And other times, seemingly, he doesn't. You know what? In the edifying times, we're being built up because there's trouble ahead. It really is. What can we do? Now, 
I've never been built up physically. I've always pretty much looked the same as I do now, except I used to be skinny and now I'm fat. That's really the only difference. Um, but people who are built up physically, they make good warriors. They, they make good fighters. And, and they're able to sustain themselves a lot longer than mealy, skinny people that really have no fight in them. They're the first ones to go. They're the first one that spiritually starves to death. So if you want to make it through the next, the next difficult time, be edified. Be part of the church. That, that's the cream of the crop. That is the, that is the steak and baked potatoes of what that book is all about. It's the best of the best. We need to be in the church so we may be edified, so that we may be built up with the precious word of God. And in this time of um, in this time of having a break, the church did that. I want you to say there's also walking still in the fear of the Lord, still understanding his almighty power, still understanding that he takes people out for rebellion. They feared the Lord. And in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. So all those wonderful three different things occurring at the same time in the Lord's church. See, I don't believe the other believers got this. I believe it was specific to the Lord's church. Acts 14. Acts 14. Acts 14, uh, verse 27. Acts 14. In verse 27, and they were and when they were come, meaning Paul and Barnabas, and when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Now, if you know your Bible, they had gone back to the original uh, church they were sent out of, to the church at Antioch. It was not a Jewish church, it was a Greek church church they were they were people who were uh who, who, who were uh who were non-jew gentiles themselves and they went back there and rehearsed all that god had done for them you know what have you ever heard a a, a really good missionary tell what god had done for them on the field you know what we don't hear much of that today so you better get your nose in a missionary book and find out what god does uh, Jonathan Edwards, read his, read his biography. It, it's amazing. Uh, he went into the heathen of this, of this country, the Native, uh, the Native Americans, in 1720. And they really wanted to kill him. But God, be, God being his helper, he saved the very man that was his translator. And they did great and wonderful things by the power of God. See, that's where it must be. If you, if you want to rejoice in the things of the Lord, you must be focused on this right here. It's for His people. Rejoicing because of the great things that God had done. That's the church. And I just ask you tonight, and you, you don't have to answer me, but answer yourself, how, my, how long has it been since you rejoiced in the Lord? Uh Getting some good news that God is still on the throne and just rejoice in the Lord. Mm -hmm. See, that is for His people, for His church, always. Acts chapter 20. Very, very important in the days which we live today. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Acts chapter 20, uh, verse 28. The Bible says this, Take heed therefore, unto yourselves. Um, you know, um, when you don't have your mama watching you when you're a child, you usually get into trouble. Anybody wants to see it, I'll show you after the service because it's not far up on my leg, about right there. I have a deep scar in my leg and what happened was over 45 years ago. But y'all know how Carlisle floods out real easy and it come up uh, a pretty good one, but I thought the backwater was going down enough, and uh, to show you how long ago it was, I think the, uh, 
the Little House series came out in a in a movie series in 1972 or 73 along in there. And I saw them go across this river in their covered wagon, and I had a little wooden wagon and got me some coat hangers and made it into a covered wagon. And I was going across, I decided I was going across that little branch over our house. And about the time I got in, mom jerked me back. I thought she's going to break my arm. And she beat the snot out of me all the way back to the house. Uh, take heed to yourself because listen, when someone else does it, it's not going to be as comfortable. Now, if I'd have used my head and not got ever, n never got in the, in, in, in the branch water to start with, I would have been fine. See, if I took heed to myself, I'd never got in there to start with. So when the Lord God does it, uh, you don't want it that way. So as Paul is writing, uh, as Luke is writing here, he says, take heed to yourself. Be careful of yourself. Watch yourself out. Take heed to your, unto yourselves and to all the flock which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers. So you know what? I've got a special, a very special responsibility. And listen, the older I get, the more that I understand this responsibility and the more fearful I become in the day of judgment because listen, if I... If, and you know what? It is me to, it is my responsibility to watch out for you. And if I see things going in a bad way, to handle it in the right way. And I don't know that I've always done that. And uh, it, it worries me. So another thing that the Lord's churches ought to have, and I certainly ain't the one to be compared, but is a good pastor. Listen to your under shepherd. Listen to what he has to say because he's been placed there by the Almighty. Have you ever thought about these believers that are outside one of the Lord's true churches? They don't have an under-shepherd. They don't have someone watching over them. They don't have someone saying, hey, you better not do that. And so, like me in the backwater, often they get jerked back. And who is the only one then that can jerk them back is the Lord God Almighty. Yeah. And listen, you would whole, whole lot rather me to deal with something than him to deal with something. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we find, we find we're, we're given that advice as well. Watch yourself. Then to feed the church of God, which he, meaning Christ, purchased with his own blood. So we find that we get special meals here that other believers don't get. Have you ever thought about before the Lord opened your heart to church truth, to predestination, you'd be like the church of Corinth. You'd have choked on it like a, like a baby uh, choking on prime rib. But because you are part of one of the Lord's churches, it's savory to you. It's good to you. And you, you eat it like a bear. And it's because you're in one of the Lord's churches. You know, uh, have you ever, and I, I, I don't try to start out with that, but have you ever tried to talk to someone about predestination and you can tell their first thought, that's not fair? I, I've seen that. You know why? Because they're not in the Lord's churches. They don't understand that. It, it's too meaty for them. It's too strong for them. And so we find that very special things were fed in a, in a unique way when we're in the Lord's church. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14. If we ever stood in the day that this is our need, it's today. 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to read just four verses 4 and 5 and we're going to be closed. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. And I want you just to note that that unknown tongue, it's not gibber jabber, it's you talking to God through the person of Christ. Does anybody really know what's being said? Probably not. You know the best the best time 
when I'm just overwhelmed in prayer, I'm not saying anything. And, and that's the best times I've had in prayer. So I, 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 I'll give that to you. you. You can chew on that this week. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth or preacheth edify the church. So this building up that we've seen all along the way, uh, it's come for preaching. Now, uh, I noticed, I'm not going to say where it was, but I was on my way to work this morning. I glanced at a building, supposed to be a house of believers, and about one-fourth of the building had, had a... Like, you know, when my kids was little, like pink and blue, like you have for little babies. And across that portion of the building, children's church. You know what? Children don't need anything different than what I need. Nah. They need preaching. They need preaching. Because, see, what, what, did, what did the Lord God promise us? Through the foolishness of preaching, He would save His elect. Uh, we, we don't need a bunch of that other mess going on, just simply good old Bible preaching. And we find here that that, that is promised to edify the Lord's people. Now notice verse 5. I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesied that he that speaketh in tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edification. Now, I'll say that to say this. Uh, I've, I have preached with an interpreter. It is very, very difficult. Yeah. But you know what? The believers in Mexico was very, very much edified by that. Uh, Brother Kraft was my interpreter. And and I would say a sentence or a little less than a sentence, and he he would he would translate into Spanish, and you can see the lights being on. See, have you ever thought about someone coming here uh, from Venezuela? I think the uh, language there is is Spanish as well, but I'm just pulling that out of thin air, and give us a great testimony and be interpreted by someone. And us to share that. Because listen, that, that's a Central American country. Listen, mo, you, you know in that place most people only about half live to adulthood? Uh, they die in their childhood. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful to hear testimony of God doing great things in a place like that? Or huh, coming from China where churches meet in basements and by secret because it's against the law. Hearing great and wonderful testimonies of what God has done for them. See, uh, certainly we need that, do we not? In the only way, when it's outside our scope, our our, our little uh, our little Stewart County and our little state of Tennessee, we never think about. Hey, there's things going over on that side of the world that I don't understand, and the only way to hear that is for someone to speak. Uh, see, we need to be edified, do we not? Uh, if we're not edified, we'll give way to the flood. It'll wash us away like a, we used to say back home, like a, a. B. Barker's pigs. He had a little farm back at home. And I think it was that same blood that I got my legs uh, whipped in. Every one of his hogs washed away. Every one of them drowned. Uh, that's what's going to happen to us if we're not edified. If we're not ready, if we're not strong, be strong, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, seeketh whom he may destroy. You know who he's going to get? He's going to get the ones that are meager. He's too lazy to go back to go after the big ones. And just like a ravening wolf, you know who? What the wolf gets? The ones that are meager and handicapped and takes them down. I want to be in one of the Lord's churches, don't you? I want, I want to be in the one that's getting nurtured in the right way.